the connected car, in my mind, is um, a place that you're able to get any information that you want instantaneously through speech interface. You don't need to use your eyes, you don't need to use your hands. Um, it's similar to uh, what Ford Sync has done, uh, but more natural. Um, no setup required. Get in the car, um, you know, 3G, 4G connection at all times. Streaming information to the car, and then the car streaming information to the cloud to come back with text-to-speech, or streaming audio commands to the cloud to come back with uh, recognition. Um, we're thinking about um, you know hybrid models uh, using recognition and text to speech that are in the car when there's you know those periods of time where you're not connecting. Um, but you know the trend is everything is going to be connected pretty soon, and even your refrigerator will be able to tell you that you need to get milk. So you know we, we feel you know over at iSpeech we feel like connection is going to be the norm and it's going to be a selling point. We've seen um, Ford sales boosted by um, the advent of sync and increasing to grow uh, year over year, and people choosing uh, Ford vehicles because of the sync over um, you know, competitors. So that's something that you know, is definitely uh, an indicator of, of where the consumer demand is, is, is going. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, technology advances, um, Speech recognition for the first time is becoming good enough. Um, it's been around for a long time, but now um, cloud computing, having giant statistical language models um, back there on the cloud, enables people to use you know products like Dragon, for instance, um, which are 99% accurate. So it, it's really a place where um, people eventually in the near future are going to be able to interact completely hands-free, just as they would uh, when they're not in the car. So that's uh, sort of my vision. And vision of the connected car with respect to uh, speech and everything. Uh, first of all, there are certain things in the car that will never be speech enabled, no matter how long we wait. And the first uh, driving task that will never be speech enabled is steering. Second is braking. Third is accelerating. And there are other safety critical functions that will never be speech enabled. Uh, there are various reasons for it, but uh, frankly, you can't steer with speech and you can't brake very well with speech. And there, there are some other analog type control uh, functions in the vehicle that, that need to kind of stay away from the speech. Uh, what I see happening, and it's already starting to happen, is a convergence of the onboard speech systems with offboard speech systems. Uh, you will start a dialogue, a speech session in the car, and you may seamlessly go off board, perhaps to a, a speech server farm that goes to a cloud, a speech cloud, or perhaps directly to the speech cloud, as Keith mentioned. The, User experience will be seamless in the sense that you won't even know necessarily when you're on board versus off board. The prompting on board will, and the trends are supporting this match the prompting, same persona as the off board. The commands, especially the universal commands such as cancel or goodbye or help or repeat, will be the same whether you're using the on board system or the off board system. Uh, the kinds of things that you will be able to do with speech, with steering and braking and those types of things uh, not being included, will be things like selecting a song, creating a short text message, entering a destination, whether it be an address or a point of interest. Uh, anything involved in entering text will, must be speech enabled to avoid driver distraction. And that's the third piece of my vision. You will see more and more simplicity in the automotive user interfaces. Uh, you'll see speech interfaces that have no visual dependencies. And overall, you'll have a user experience that doesn't cause driver distraction. Well, um, I don't have 
much to add to what they said. That's we all share those comments. Uh, what I will add is um, going out a little further. Uh, when you talk about uh, the connected car, so we talked about speech. So I'll talk a little bit more about the connected car. From the concept of a connected car, and at Clemson University, we have this International Center for Automotive Research. It's in Greenville, South Carolina, and they build a car every year. The, the class of seniors get to build a concept car. BMW donates and all these other industries come and they give us a car and we gut it and build a brand new car. So the concept of a connected car uh, does have all the speech capabilities I mentioned, but then there's more to that. Uh, the car is communicating with other cars. That's an interesting thought and we can talk more about that later. Uh, also, if you look at the idea of the car, doing its own navigation, meaning can the car drive itself. Uh, that sounds strange, but uh, Google is doing this right now. And you have to ask, well, why is Google doing this? There's a huge market for this, um, given the number of deaths and accidents and, and car-related crashes. Connected cars, and for Google, the idea of a connected car is all that information they have from searching, and navigation, can they connect their database, basically, their knowledge base to the car and enable the car in new ways. So the connected car in a futuristic perspective that we've talked about a car driving itself is actually something that's being tested and tried. Um, I think it was Utah that passed a law that uh, self-driving cars are legal. So it's not as far away as you may think that these kind of things are on the horizon. So I, I won't say more. We can talk more in a discussion about those things. Okay. Thank you, Juan. Um, at this point, uh, we're ready to receive questions from the audience. So uh, <clears throat> please, put your hand. The biggest problem I have today is when the light turns green, the people in front of me don't go. There's, uh, don't get behind people. <laughs> <laughs> They're looking at their iPhones. It, it happens every day now. The light turns green and nobody goes. Well, I, you have to beep the horn. Right, but that was part of the idea of the car driving itself and the fact that people actually look at the phone while they're stopped, that's actually legal. The, the law is interesting across the United States. So there are bans on texting while driving, which can't be enforced, actually. There are bans on handheld devices while driving, which technically said to me that if you stop at a stop sign, you can look at it, which is the situation you're experiencing. Now, the, da the data is showing us that the bans on handheld devices had an inverse effect, effect in that people were doing this before, now they're doing this. And accidents actually increased because they're trying to hide and do it. Uh, and, and so you, that is an interesting problem, but he kind of talked about this, is uh, the definition of hands-free, eyes-free. There is a debate about what does that mean? What is true hands-free, hands eyes-free? So, sorry, but. but... But, you know, to your point, there are laws, there are more and more laws, and people are going to start getting fined when they get caught doing anything with mobile devices while they're on the road. That's, that's the trend. Yeah. And remember this, 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 well, I'm at a university, so I, I'm with a bunch of college kids, and so Clemson banned texting while driving. So if an officer pulled you over and you were doing this, they say, well, I'm going to give you a ticket for texting while driving, and the kid says, I was calling my mother, what is the officer going to do? You can't prove they were texting. They said they were calling. The ban is on texting, not on calling. That is a very important distinction. Unless the officer has the right to confiscate your phone, which that opens up a whole other area of privacy. So this is uh, an interesting debate. Now, the Department of Labor has come out, the United States Department of Labor has come out, uh, 
uh, Ray LaHood talks about this. They are actually taking action against companies. So if you work for a company and you said, I felt uh, coerced in checking the text message while I'm driving, the Department of Labor will go after that company. So there's a lot of factors being played out here, in particular in the United States, around this idea. Yes, um, you guys have talked about, you, you spoke about the convergence of onboard and offboard, you mentioned cloud-based. Uh, where do you see voice recognition going? Actually, I'd like to hear your, all of your views. Uh, is it going to be made onboard, offboard? And if it's offboard, how do you reconcile the uh, you know, increasing accuracy and lowering latency? Basically? I'll go, Keith will probably want to, I'll you do more on the cloud. Okay. So, Let's start uh, with the onboard system. First of all, there are certain tasks that are, that, that are necessarily local to the car. For example, if you want to change radio stations, it doesn't make sense to go to the cloud to handle that type of a speech task. And there is initiating intent or indicating intent that, that generally needs to be achieved first before you go to, go to the cloud to do something. Specific. As far as accuracy, the onboard systems, it, it, this is a, my opinion, but, but I, I believe it's a trend, the onboard systems are going to tend to keep, keep toward simple speech recognition, you know, finite grammars, ones that are easy to manage, not large vocabularies, and then you'll go uh, to the cloud for the more difficult speech recognition tasks where you're perhaps saying something like a destination or a song name or even a text message. Um, accuracy on board can be achieved by keeping the grammar small. Off board, cloud-based recognition. There are lots of uh, lots of ideas. Others can talk about them, but one is to use what's called human-assisted speech recognition because uh, in a hands-free environment while you're driving, the, the kind of accuracy that you really need uh, isn't quite achievable. With can you hear me? It's, isn't quite where it needs to be based on a lot of data that I'm privy to. Um, to add a follow-up question, you mentioned that um, we're going to keep the speed recognition simple, small <coughs> kind of grammars and so forth in car, and have all the more sophisticated stuff in the cloud. Right. How about a situation where you need the result of the recognition action in the car, such as putting in a long, complex address for your GPS to find? So you think that's going to go to the cloud? The cloud's going to send it back and then we'll stuff it in the GPS or what? Well, there, there are a couple ways to, to do that, but generally if you speak a text string, whether it be a song name or a long address or a text message, I don't think you'll ever see really long emails being done while you're driving, but maybe you will. Uh, the, one way to, to do it, to play back the result, is you can take the text string and manage the song board and play it back via TTS or you can take the text string as it's determined in the cloud and over a voice channel play text speech into the car without using a TTS engine within the car. It's done both ways. I'll, I'll pick up uh, where you left off. I, I think that uh, you, know, you hit the nail on the head with everything. Um, the, the way we look at it um, at iSpeech, um, w without good connections, there is no connected car. So you know, when the car has 3G, when the car has 4G, there's the connection. We're able to make the cloud connection. Right now, people are thinking of connected cloud basically um, as little as possible, as much as necessary. So if we can do it in the car, we want to do it in the car, um, because then we don't have to worry about a connection. But are we going to have um, you know, the processing power in the car to, uh, to do natural language processing to um, to you know, use a statistical language model based on you know hundreds of millions of messages, probably not. And can we update that on the fly if it's embedded in the car? Probably not. So in the future, where we have those connections available in the car, when the car comes with 3G, when you're always connected seamlessly, then we're going to see it switch to the cloud being um, as much as possible. Uh, the cloud's always going to be faster. Latency issues are addressed by streaming. Um, there's a lot of great codecs you can check out to do that. Um, so if you if you stream your audio to the cloud, then by the time the person's done speaking, you already have your response. 
and it's just a simple text response that comes back. So, you know, or some XML. So it's really nothing um, that, that's too intensive to be sent back. Um, basically, the way we look at it, of course, we're a cloud-based company, so uh, we, we love people to use the cloud. Um, but, but at this point, you know, the hybrid systems uh, are really going to be where it's at for the next few years until that connection actually exists. And I want to add one thing to his response. I agree with it. Uh, you can be a connected car, if you will, with a wireless voice channel, uh, which is uh, rather available as you drive anywhere. And from, from, or I should say over that wireless channel, you can transmit spoken utterances that can then be piped to the cloud manage that way. That's actually how we do it at ATX because of the reasons that Heath mentioned as far as coverage goes. And, and I, if I could just add, um, you know, it would be really easy to do if the carriers allowed you to tether automatically to their phone and create a little hotspot out of your phone. We would have connected cars right now. Uh, if you guys read the news you saw last week, AT&T uh, and then Verizon uh, right after just banned um, the use of jailbroken iPhones uh, for tethering purposes. So we're not really going anywhere with that, uh, not unless you pay them 20 bucks a month or whatever it is that they want to get you to tether it. Um, so, you know, but eventually the cars themselves are going to come with a wireless plane. Uh, and that's what we're going to see in the really near future on the high end cars, and then subsequently, you know, on the non BMWs. On the mass market. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so I know there's, uh, there's definitely some difficulties with doing far field recognition in cars sometimes, depending on road noise and different speakers and like that. Um, I'm kind of curious also from the nuance guys. Like, I hear a lot of things about doing you know, microphone arrays, being formed, and things like that, which is to every individual car. Um, where do you see the solutions to that? Is, is it really making custom, uh, custom piece of hardware to your car? Especially if you're using cloud based recognition, like high speech, where you might need let me just do one a short one and then let the other panelists comment. Uh, cars that include speech enablement generally have a Bluetooth hands free system, so your Bluetooth enabled phone can be used in a hands free manner. These cars that are Bluetooth capable also have built in voice dialing. That said, there's, al there's already a, an audio hands free system in the vehicle that is optimized to have human conversations. And that's going to influence, that system going to influence the microphone solution as we move forward. Any other? Uh, yeah, I'd like to comment on that. Uh, clearly, the in-vehicle environment is very difficult to manage. Um, and uh, it's very important. It, it nuance what we try to do is characterize an in-vehicle environment in the products that we have. Because what, what we're seeing is that people do accommodate 
the environment, just like this versus this. And, and by the way, we, we just completed a study that showed this has gotten very good uh, with college kids as far as distraction. They are very good at that, at not looking and doing it now. From a product the big debate here that isn't talked about as, as much when we talk about uh, biometrics is the privacy issue. So I was at Google uh, last month and they were looking at who are we going to hire at Google for our research and what are our areas of interest. And in the top, they had a top five and one of their top five is privacy. So this whole idea of using speaker verification, biometrics, any data they can collect could make their system work better for you. Uh, like in, the, in their browser now, Chrome, they have a microphone and you can speak to Google in the searches. And, and so they say, well, if you were to volunteer for us to learn your voice better, we can accommodate you better. But then you have the government and others saying, well, is, do we have privacy issues here and violations? So I think this, there's a debate that is occurring uh, about biometrics and it's not settled. The technology is a little bit ahead of you know, where we are as a society on what to do about this. Because th there is a debate, if someone steals your biometric, your identity, what, is, what are the implications for that? It's not, I mean, if I steal your pen, you just change your pen. If I got your iris some kind of way, what are you gonna do? You, you, so there's, there's some implications here that haven't been fully vetted yet. And I think a lot of the OEMs and others who were saying, Look, I don't know that I want to be the first to walk out there and do these kind of things. Yeah, let me add something to the privacy issue. Uh, it's a fact, without getting into details, that there are some laws about privacy and they're getting stricter. And for example, one of the states, California, uh, has legislation such that if you do any kind of speech recognition, let's just say off board, although the, the laws are more open than that, people need to be warned that their calls may be recorded for quality, recorded or monitored for quality purposes. And when you start throwing that into the user experience every time you use a speech system, it kind of you know makes you step back. When you get into something like biometrics, could even be more so the case. So, because that's what people do to break something like speed verification, they make recordings. Right. 